Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss an overview of key studies in early breast cancer this year. These are my disclosures. Despite our times, we've continued to make strides in early breast cancer with the approval of pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy in triple negative breast cancer and abemacyclib with endocrine therapy for high risk ER positive breast cancer patients. Keynote 522 and Monarch E that led to the approval of these treatments fit into the first theme of this year, which is optimizing therapy for patients with high risk early breast cancer. Other studies with a similar theme, testing therapy escalation for high risk patients, include the ECOG Acrin EA 1131, evaluating platinum versus capecitabine in residual TNBC, and Olympia, evaluating Olaparib in patients with high risk. BRCA associated HER2 negative early breast cancer. The second theme is de escalating therapy in lower risk patients. And HER2 positive early breast cancer is an example of where several de escalation studies are ongoing. So, first, let's discuss updates in HER2 positive early breast cancer. Different de escalation strategies for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer have been explored or are currently ongoing. The standard way we've traditionally managed these patients is with either neoadjuvant or adjuvant polychemotherapy plus HER2 blockade. De-escalation strategies have included reducing chemotherapy intensity on approaches such as on APT attempts and TRAIN2, as well as the ongoing COMPASS HER2 PCR and decrescendo studies. The other main strategy that has been explored has been reducing the duration of trastuzumab which has been evaluated on several multiple studies. Several studies in the neoadjuvant setting have shown that in HER2 positive breast cancer, hormone receptor negative and hormone receptor positive disease appear to be biologically distinct as evidenced by the PCR rates following neoadjuvant therapy. These trials show that the PCR rates following chemotherapy and anti-HER2 therapy is much lower in patients who have hormone receptor positive disease, disease versus those with hormone receptor negative disease. The WSG ADAPT hormone receptor negative HER2 positive trial fills a gap in de-escalation strategies. This is a subtype driven de-escalation protocol for hormone receptor negative HER2 positive early breast cancer patients. This is the schema of this trial, which evaluated the efficacy of neoadjuvant dual HER2 blockade with or without paclitaxel. The PCR rate has previously been reported and the most recent update shows the long-term outcomes. As a reminder, patients who got dual HER2 blockade without chemotherapy achieved a pathological complete response rate of 34% and those who received chemotherapy in addition had a PCR of 90%. The secondary endpoint of five-year invasive disease-free survival was 87% in the chemotherapy-free arm A patients and 98% in patients on arm B, and overall survival was excellent at over 90% on both study arms. With 12 weeks of trastuzumab and pertuzumab in patients on arm A, Achieving a PCR was associated with an excellent five-year IDFS of 98% and just as good as for those patients who received chemotherapy in arm B. It must be noted, however, that over 70% excuse me, over 70 of patients in arm A did go on to receive adjuvant chemotherapy. And so trying to identify these patients who will do well with the chemotherapy-free approach is needed for further de-escalation studies. And so going forward, how else might we use other biomarkers to guide patient selection for further chemotherapy-free trials in HER2 positive uh, disease while maintaining or increasing PCR rates and survival and minimizing toxicities? The HER2 enriched subtype within HER2 positive breast cancer is associated with PCR following neoadjuvant HER2 blockade in the absence of chemotherapy, this has been seen in both the Pamela and Neil's first studies. In Frogain, metabolic response by PET imaging was able to identify patients more likely to benefit from a chemotherapy-free approach 
with HER2 blockade with uh, just trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Early non-response by a lack of KI67 drop is also a strong predictor of non-PCR in this current ADAPT trial and in PALTAN, which is a phase two study of neoadjuvant letrozole, palbociclib, and trastuzumab. And in patients with tumors with high expression of immune markers, HP alone has similar benefits as patients treated with chemotherapy plus trastuzumab and pertuzumab on Neospur. Other biomarkers which have been evaluated as predictive of outcomes are PIK3CA status, serum TGF alpha, and early ctDNA dynamics. So these large two, um, these two large neoadjuvant studies, Compass HER2 PCR and Decrescendo, both evaluating lower chemotherapy intensity, both have rich biomarker programs which may help us understand which patients may be most suitable for de-escalation in the future. Shifting now to triple negative breast cancer. Gepar Nuevo was a phase two neoadjuvant trial for TNBC patients. 174 patients received neoadjuvant chemotherapy with NAB paclitaxel followed by EC with or without Dervalumab. The primary endpoint has been published and showed no difference in PCR rates between the two study arms although those who received Dovalumab had numerically higher PCR rates. At a median follow-up of approximately 44 months, secondary long-term outcomes showed a consistently higher three-year IDFS, DDFS, and overall survival, favoring patients randomized to the Dovalumab arm, despite no difference in pathological complete response. The difference in three-year IDFS is approximately 8%. The randomized Keynote 522 evaluating carboplatin and taxane followed by AC with or without pembrolizumab, also in early triple negative breast cancer, also had updates presented at ESMO and at this conference. As a reminder, the primary endpoint was met, demonstrating a higher PCR of 65% versus 51%, favoring those who received pembrolizumab. The long-term outcomes are now at a median follow-up of just over three years and show a three-year EFS of 84% versus 77% with an absolute benefit of almost 8%. One year of pembrolizumab is associated with a 37% risk reduction in an EFS event. Three-year overall survival data is still immature but shows an encouraging almost 3% difference. Based on these long-term updates, this regimen has now been approved and represents a new standard of care for our eligible patients with early TNBC. There has been some discussion about whether the magnitude of benefit would have been this large if a more standard approach of dose-dense AC was utilized in this trial. We also saw the long-term outcomes according to PCR and treatment arm. In Keynote 522, long-term outcomes in those who achieve PCR are very similar irrespective of treat treatment arm, which begs the question on, of if the adjuvant portion of the pembrolizumab is necessary for those patients who get a PCR, particularly as they do just as well as those patients treated with placebo. Data from the ongoing SWOG 1418 with adjuvant pembrolizumab long-term data from Neotrip, which did not have an adjuvant checkpoint inhibitor portion, and other trials in development should help answer this question in future. But for now, what we do know is that one year of pembrolizumab results in a 37% risk reduction. I also want to point out that the Gepa Nuevo study suggested an apparent split of almost 10% between PCR patients. The three-year IDFS in PCR patients on the placebo arm is only 86%, showing that this arm underperformed, likely due to small sample size. Therefore, it is difficult to conclude that the value map had as much benefit in PCR patients as the curves here suggest. Patients with residual triple negative breast cancer have very poor outcomes depending on the extent of residual disease and we know that pre-immunotherapy, pre adjuvant capecitabine results in both a PFS and overall survival improvement, 
with an over 40% risk reduction in a DFS event. EA 1131 was to determine if platinum would be better than observation, and then subsequently capecitabine when that became the standard of care after the CREATE-X study reported. This trial randomized patients who had residual triple negative breast cancer following standard neoadjuvant chemotherapy to carboplatin or cisplatin versus capecitabine. The trial was stopped early due to futility, but did accrue approximately 400 out of a planned 700 patients. The primary endpoint was IDFS in patients with basal subtype triple negative breast cancer. The results were negative with the three-year IDFS being less than 50% on both study arms. It's possible that the long time to adjuvant therapy of approximately four months on this trial could have contributed to the poor outcomes in both arms. Patients also had poorer outcomes than those on the CREATE-X study. However, this population in EA1131 was much higher risk and received six cycles of capecitabine versus the six to eight cycles patients on CREATE-X received. However, these studies are consistent with a prior phase three study evaluating adjuvant capecitabine, which showed no difference or no benefit in patients with basal triple negative breast cancer. And so clearly triple negative breast cancer patients with a basal subtype who have residual disease is a subgroup of very high risk patients that need more strategies to improve their outcomes. Other than molecular subtyping, ctDNA is also being explored as a tool to further risk stratify patients and help us identify those patients in whom early intervention possibly might change the natural history of residual TNBC. I'll encourage you to look at the oral presentation from the c track tn trial from this conference. Additionally, Aspria and Preserver studies are evaluating further adjuvant therapy in TNBC patients with circulating tumor DNA. For patients with BRCA-associated metastatic breast cancer, we now have two approved POP inhibitors based on data from the Olympiad study and EMBRACA showing a higher PFS with POP inhibition versus chemotherapy or physician's choice. As such, these agents are now being evaluated in the earlier disease setting. Neotala is a phase two study with neoadjuvant talazoparib in patients with germline BRCA1 or two associated early breast cancer. All patients had triple negative breast cancer and received six months of neoadjuvant therapy. They achieved an impressive PCR of 46%, which is very close to what we see with standard anthracycline and taxane neoadjuvant chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer. However, 16% of patients did progress during neoadjuvant therapy which is higher than what we would typically see in clinic with chemotherapy. The Olympia phase three study evaluated one year of adjuvant olaparib in high risk HER2 negative BRCA associated early breast cancer. And since this is a practice changing trial, I wanted to spend a few minutes reviewing the eligibility. Patients with triple negative breast cancer had to have residual disease following chemotherapy or for those patients who did not receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy, they had to have pathological T2 or node positive tumors. Patients with hormone receptor positive disease had to have non-PCR with a CPS EG score of at least three, or if they were treated adjuvantly, they had to have at least four positive lymph nodes. IDFS was the primary endpoint and one year of olaparib resulted in a 42% risk reduction with an absolute difference of almost 9% at three years. Importantly for our patients, there were no additional cases of MDS or AML in those patients who received olaparib. Treat treatment discontinuation was seen in approximately 10% of those who received olaparib versus under 5% of patients who received placebo and the serious adverse event rates were about the same on both study arms. And so for our BRCA positive patients with residual triple negative breast cancer, do we choose olaparib or capecitabine? 
Based on the Olympiad study in the advanced setting, Olaparib may be a superior choice as Olaparib out outperformed chemotherapy or physician's choice and approximately 45% of those patients received capecitabine. Also, patients who have BRCA-associated triple negative breast cancer are more likely to have a basal subtype. And we know that in EA1131, capecitabine underperformed in patients with basal triple negative breast cancer. And so these results are practice changing and the NCCN genetic testing guidelines have been updated to reflect this study. And as such, clinicians should start to pay very close attention to improving equity and the utilization of genetic counseling and testing for our patients. Since most of these patients are still recovering from chemotherapy, it's necessary to understand the additional symptom burden that one year of adjuvant alaparib will bring to patients. Quality of life data presented at this meeting shows that at six and 12 months, alaparib treated patients experienced slightly more fatigue than patients who received placebo. However, the difference was not clinically significant. Similarly, at the similar time points of six and 12 months, nausea and vomiting was also worse, but patients had recovered by 18 and 24 months. And so overall, adjuvant tolaparib given for one year was relatively well tolerated. So what do these updates mean for our patients? Those with high risk early triple negative breast cancer now have a new standard option available as neoadjuvant pembrolizumab with chemotherapy, followed by adjuvant pembrolizumab. One year of adjuvant or laparib for eligible patients with BRCA-associated HER2 negative early breast cancer is well tolerated and improves clinical outcomes. The last part of the talk focuses on key study updates in hormone receptor positive breast cancer. MA32 is a phase three trial evaluating five years of adjuvant metformin on recurrence and survival in early breast cancer. The use of metformin in the prevention or treatment of cancers is based on evidence from a number of research fields. Specifically with regards to breast cancer, there are both preclinical and clinical data showing activity in patients who also receive concurrent metformin for diabetes. MA32 randomized moderate to high risk hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients to metformin versus placebo. An earlier interim analysis showed, showed futility in hormone receptor negative patients so this report represents only those patients who are hormone receptor positive. The results were negative with no difference in IDFS on both arms, reminding us that preclinical data and intermediate endpoints such as KI-67 do not always translate to clinical benefits for patients in larger studies. Moving now on to CDK4-6 inhibitors. Based on the activity of CDK4-6 inhibitors in the advanced setting, several trials, including PALAS, have investigated the efficacy in the earlier stage setting. As a reminder, PALAS randomized 5,700 patients to endocrine therapy with or without palbociclib for two years. The primary re results of IDFS did not show any benefit with two years of adjuvant palbociclib. At a median follow-up of 31 months, there's still no significant difference in four-year IDFS, which is approximately 84% on both arms. Longer follow-up also shows no difference in DRFS, local regional free recurrent survival or overall survival. Monarch E is a phase three open label trial that randomized 5,600 patients to adjuvant endocrine therapy for five years with or without abemacyclib for two years. Cohort one enrolled patients with four positive lymph nodes or one to three positive lymph nodes and either grade three disease or tumors five centimeters or larger, while cohort two enrolled patients with one to three positive lymph nodes and a KI-67 of at least 20%. 
The primary endpoint was IDFS in the ITT population. At the most recent update, at a median follow-up of 27 months, representing an additional eight months of follow-up, the benefit of abemaciclib extends beyond the two-year treatment period. There's a 30% reduction in the risk of developing an IDFS event and a, and a now larger absolute difference of 5.4 at three years versus the initial report of 2.7% at two years. Looking at IDFS, according to KI-67 in patients in cohort one, KI-67 is not predictive of benefit as patients who have either low or high KI-67 benefit from abemaciclib. In patients with a low KI-67 in the upper two lines, there's a 30% risk reduction and an absolute difference of 4.5% with abemaciclib. And in patients with a high KI-67, the risk reduction is 37% and the absolute difference is 7%. And so these updated results continue to show us that two years of adjuvant abemaciclib prevents early recurrences in patients with primary endocrine resistance. Based on these recent updates, the FDA has approved abemaciclib in patients with node positive disease at high risk for recurrence and a KI-67 of 20% or greater, despite the data showing that KI-67 does not seem to be predictive of benefit. But perhaps this is a mechanism by the FDA to restrict this approval, at least for now, to the patients at the highest risk for recurrence. And also possibly as Fonac E results conflict, from, conflict with data from both Pallas and Penelope B. Monarch E was a higher risk population than Pallas, but even in the subgroup of high risk patients in Pallas, there was still no benefit with parbociclib. It's possible that the difference in continuous drug scheduling, scheduling with abemaciclib may have an impact in micrometastatic disease in the earlier stage setting. It's also possible that there's a different activity profile for both drugs, as abemaciclib appears to have pronounced activity in primary endocrine resistance in Monarch 2, while palbociclib is very strong in primary endocrine sensitivity in Paloma 3. However, PALAS, which is now at a median follow-up of 31 months, while still early for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, it's unlikely that adjuvant palbociclib will show an eventual benefit in endocrine sensitive patients who will relapse later. Natalie, evaluating three years of adjuvant ribociclib has completed accrual, and it will be interesting to see what those results are. Further follow-up of Monarch E patients is needed to determine the impact on late recurrences, as well as the impact on overall survival. We also need to start to think about how we will eventually sequence other therapies, such as adju adjuvant SIRDs currently, currently in development, if those trials end up being positive. And more than ever before, multidisciplinary management is key for these patients as documentation of, of positive lymph nodes is an eligibility criteria for adjuvant abemaciclib. Moving on to the Rx Bonder trial, I think it's fair to say that since these results at this meeting last year, medical oncologists have wrestled with how best to treat premenopausal women with hormone receptor positive early breast cancer with one to three positive lymph nodes. As a reminder, our expander randomized 5,000 women to evaluate the benefit of endocrine therapy versus endocrine therapy plus chemotherapy for patients with one to three positive lymph nodes and oncotype scores of 25 or less. The median follow-up is now at just over six years. Postmenopausal women do not benefit from chemotherapy with a five-year IDFS of approximately 91% in both groups. However, among premenopausal women, there continues to be a benefit from chemotherapy, and this is regardless of recurrent score. The five-year IDFS rate for the chemotherapy and hormone therapy treated group is 94% compared with 
in those patients who received endocrine therapy alone. And this translates to an absolute difference of 5% and a risk reduction of 36%. This is an exploratory analysis of IDFS in patients treated with endocrine therapy alone, according to whether they received ovarian function suppression or not. This is important as many clinicians wonder if the chemotherapy benefits seen in young women with node positive disease can be achieved by ovarian function suppression added to standard endocrine therapy. If this was the case, we would expect that those who receive ovarian function suppression will do better than those who receive endocrine therapy alone, and perhaps just as well as those patients who receive chemotherapy in addition. This data shows that there's no difference in ovarian, in ovarian function suppression, and, but needs to be interpreted carefully as this is a post hoc analysis and not designed to answer this question. And so whether or not ovarian function suppression with standard endocrine therapy is as good as chemotherapy in patients with premenopausal node positive breast cancer continues to remain an open question. So what do these updates mean for our patients? First, those with high risk node positive breast cancer and a high KI-67 score now have the option of receiving two years of adjuvant abemocyclib to improve clinical outcomes. Second, the data confirm that postmenopausal women with one to three positive lymph nodes and a recurrence score of zero to 25 can safe, safely forego chemotherapy. And third, longer follow-up shows that premenopausal women with one to three positive lymph nodes are in a recurrence score of zero to 25 benefit from chemotherapy. However, it's still unclear if this benefit can be achieved by ovarian function suppression with endocrine therapy. Good science leads to more questions, and these are a few of the questions raised from studies these, this year. Who are those HER2 positive patients that will do well with biologic therapy only or other de-escalation strategies? Who are those patients with triple negative breast cancer who will achieve a PCR with chemo alone and perhaps can be spared checkpoint inhibition as they seem to do just as well as those patients who achieve a PCR with checkpoint inhibition. Is adjuvant checkpoint inhibition necessary for patients who achieve a PCR after neoadjuvant checkpoint inhibition with chemotherapy? And how do we sequence adjuvant therapies in non-PCR or high-risk early breast cancer settings. For instance, how effective is adjuvant capecitabine after chemo and checkpoint inhibition? What is the role of olaparib after chemo and checkpoint inhibition in BRCA-associated triple negative breast cancer patients? And what is the role of olaparib versus abemocyclib in high-risk BRCA-associated hormone receptor positive early breast cancer? Who are those premenopausal node positive patients that can safely forego chemotherapy and perhaps do as well, just as well with ovarian function suppression and endocrine therapy? And lastly, is it possible to determine the benefits of CDK4-6 inhibition with endocrine therapy in patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer using the molecular platforms currently in clinical use? In early breast cancer, most patients are cured and go on to live full and long lives. Therefore, trying to balance the long-term treatment-related toxicities and financial burden with the expected disease course and magnitude of benefit from adding on more therapies is critical. Lastly, I'll be remiss if I don't use this platform to show you the ongoing disparities we have in breast cancer. This graph here shows the excess death rate in Blacks in the US between 2011 and 2015. The mortality rate ratios vary widely in the United States, ranging from 20% in Nevada to almost 70% in Louisiana. In the lighter shaded states, breast cancer death rates are not statistically significantly different between Blacks and Whites. 
the states with the red arrows that have the highest differences have not yet or had not yet adopted Medicaid expansion as at the time of this analysis. And so improving access and screening programs will continue to shift breast cancers towards an earlier diagnosis and will help in closing the ongoing racial disparity gaps and improve outcomes for all women. Thank you for your attention.